Um, so welcome everyone to the first in-person AI for Healthcare event. We're super excited to finally be hosting an in-person event where we can all meet face-to-face. -face. I know we've all missed that a lot. So it's really cool to see you all have turned out and it seems like there's already a bit of a buzz. So that's very exciting. Um, before we get into it, I would just like to acknowledge the First Nations people as the traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is taking place today. I recognise the country north and south of Brisbane River as the home of the Turrbal and Jagra nations, and I pay deep respects to the elders past, present and future. So um, I am the MedTech Program Manager for the Queensland AI Hub, for those who don't know me. Um, I also have another role as the Partnerships Manager at Datawi, which is a um, data-enabled technology company, and we work on clinical data. So that's where my interest lies, and I'm really passionate about supporting the growth of AI for healthcare, not only in Queensland, but throughout Australia and the world, and also about um, really supporting the translation of the amazing technology that we are already building here into the healthcare system. Um, and so I think that's one of the main goals is to get people like yourselves who have an interest in this space all in the same room and get inspired by the amazing tech that's being developed here in Queensland already. Um, maybe ignite some new ideas and collaborations um, and just really fuel this great ecosystem that we have. So uh, we've got four amazing speakers tonight. Um, so I won't hold back any longer, I'll let you start hearing from those. Um, what's gonna happen is each speaker will talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll have five minutes of Q&A after each talk. So if you can hold your burning questions for, for after each talk. Um, and then afterwards we will have some time for more networking and some drinks and nibbles so you can hang around afterwards. So our first speaker tonight is Dr. Nigel Greenwood. Dr. Nigel Greenwood is an applied mathematician with particular expertise in novel forms of artificial intelligence. He's one of Australia's Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellows, administered by the University of New South Wales, is a former honorary senior fellow in the School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Queensland, and is a former senior analyst at the Australian Government's Department of Climate Change. He's a technology entrepreneur and founder and CEO of the Machine Genes Group of AI Companies, and is a lovely place, and a named inventor of multiple US patents and patent applications in medical and engineering, applications of novel forms of machine intelligence. He has invented new forms of evolutionary machine learning built on a metaphor of evolutionary ecosystems, not artificial neural networks, and consequently demonstrated a novel form of adversarial AI in 2012, two years before the invention of generative adversarial networks. This work has recently been granted a US patent, and in 2016 to 2020, he's led the team Machine Genes in the IBM Watson AI X Prize, the global race to use AI to address some of humanity's most pressing problems, and were listed as one of the 10 semi-finalists worldwide. It's incredible. Um, his team has been demonstrating the world's first genuinely machine intelligent artificial pancreas suitable for the most unstable forms of type 1 diabetes. So it's an impressive bio um, for an impressive individual. Welcome, Nigel. Um, yeah, welcome him to the stage, please. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, just... uh, right, can everyone hear me? Wonderful. Right, uh, I'm Nigel Greenwood. Um, so we're uh, Machine Genes, uh, a group of AI companies. In particular, I'll be uh, demonstrating work from one of the companies, Diabetes Neuromathics. Now, <clears throat> Voltaire once said, if it is true God created man in his own image, man has certainly returned the compliment. We could say something similar about artificial intelligence. Um, you know, for, for the last, really the last 20 years at least, the dominant form of machine learning in the world is predicated on artificial neural networks um, based on a metaphor of the human visual cortex. Uh, it is not the only form of machine learning, uh, but it has become so ubiquitous that to many people, the term machine learning and neural networks have become synonymous. And so AI has become based on um, a neural networks construct. We are going to show you today something different. 
instead of doing neural networks, we're going to show you a form of machine learning predicated on evolutionary dynamics, uh, evolutionary ecosystems. And we will show you that you can achieve novel forms of AI built on top of that, which have superior capabilities over those of neural networks for some applications. I mean, neural networks are very, very important, obviously, for a lot of applications, but we're just going to show you some areas in which an alternative approach will work better. So, the problem with conventional neural networks based machine learning, and I'm sure my colleagues will agree with this one, uh, essentially distills into three things. How to teach it, what it knows, and how it advises. You throw enormous amounts of data at a um, neural network and it will find patterns. It doesn't actually model those patterns so much as become those patterns. So it lacks epistemological knowledge. It can never tell you what it knows. It simply is. So the thing is, it may be seeing genuine patterns in the data or it may be seeing the equivalent of faces in clouds and it can't really tell you which is which. So you then have the black box problem of what it knows and trying to elicit why it is saying what it says, which also then means it's a bit like having a conversation with a sphinx. Having said all of those negatives, as I've said, neural networks are very, very useful for a huge class of problems. Uh, but when you're dealing with clinical deployment of AI, you want something thoroughly different. In particular, you want to be able to achieve machine learning on tiny data sets you know, literally 72 hours or four weeks rather than six months. You want to, those data sets to be individual, so a single person's medical history, not you know, a, a massed aggregate of medical histories. You want full explainability or explicability. If you're a clinician and you're about to act on the advice of an AI, you need to understand why it is suggesting what it is suggesting. Uh, otherwise, you know, often you can't accept it, even if it seems good advice. Um, you need to be able to go beyond training data you need to say, all right, the data is of a series of adverse events, but I need you to advise me on how to achieve a good outcome clinically. Um, and then you need to have it comfortable with dealing with the unknown in the sense of it needs to be able to tell you known unknowns, to borrow a line from Donald Rumsfeld, and it needs to be able to tell you ways it can work through some of these known unknowns to, to give you, the clinician, um, some, some strategies. And it also needs to be able to tell you when it's throwing its hands up in the air and simply say, I have no idea. This is not disease X. You told me this was disease X. It just isn't. Uh, move along and, and do something else. The net result is collaborative interactive dosing to achieve novel therapies with organ scale personalized medicine without genomics. And that's the point of this. Um, now, this is not um, a boast. This is simply to, to demonstrate two things. The first is that what I'm going to show you has gone through years of peer review. So it's, it's not vaporware. It's, it's all been uh, demonstrated and peer reviewed. And the other point is that Queensland produces world-class AI. In fact, always has, well before me. <laughs> um, in fact, in 1990, as um, I would uh, uh, show you in a moment, uh, under Jan Skoronsky, Department of Mathematics at UQ was one of the world's leader in what we would now call AI. Um, so, if for any mathematicians in the room, um, we replaced um, the numerical constructs of neural networks uh, with a completely different data structure, which I refer to as the Trinity. Uh, the, the point of it, so you have a numerical chromosome, like a genetic algorithm, you have an algebraic model, and you have trajectories in state space. You combine those three things, and you have something that can be used to explain uh, machine learning knowledge, both to the machine itself and other machines, and also to clinicians. So uh, you actually have a mode of communicating at a fundamental level uh, as you build up your machine learning and then consequent AI. Uh, distilling evolutionary machine learning in a minute was a challenge I gave to one of my colleagues. And so we managed to, uh, let's see if I can get this to work. We take the best models of type one diabetes in this case from the medical literature and we pull out all the parameters that are unknown and we put them into genes of chromosomes, simulated chromosomes. And we take uh, candidate numbers 
and we encode these. We have chromosomes, they breed like real chromosomes, crossover and inheritance, and they produce future generations. They suffer mutations. And so the, the, the data uh, will change across chromosomes. Then each of these corresponds effectively with a creature, which is uh, basically we're capturing complex ecological behavior at different scales uh, to capture complex behavior in different environments, different levels of fitness and predation. Why do we do all this? Because this kind of evolutionary behavior can be distilled into a computational circuit. And what we do with this is we literally take the best models of type 1 diabetes from the medical literature. We take individual medical histories of people with really bad, really unstable type 1, and we force evolution to happen until the best models in the medical literature behave completely consistently with the individual medical histories. And if we do it uh, in this way, we can achieve uh, real breakthroughs in AI. Now, uh, just a brief run through the history. Um, essentially, uh, Queensland in the 1970s to the 1990s had some of the world's top AI people working here, collaborating with uh, counterparts in Berkeley and Paris and um, uh, did a lot of early work. Uh, I took that work, it was the last man standing in 1995 in effect, and uh, solved some key problems with it and used it to solve problems with the thing called genetic algorithms. And so then uh, over the years, uh, demonstrated this technology with both uh, medical application with type one diabetes and also with engines. Aviation engines surprisingly have a lot of uh, points of commonality with the medicine. This has been uh, externally assessed and validated across the years. We did a demo for Rolls-Royce uh, in the UK over three years with engines. Um, uh, the UN AI for Good Summit, we were uh, showcased there in 2018 and in Europe's. And so, uh, yeah, it's gone through the ringer, particularly with the AIX Prize. Now, what's the medical problem we're solving? Consider insulin. It's a hormone in the human body that regulates blood glucose. In type 1 diabetes, all the insulin-producing cells in the pancreas die. So people with type 1 have to take medical insulin every day for the rest of their lives. Without medical insulin, their condition is fatal. Problem is that um, glucose insulin dynamics within the human body are well understood structurally, but everyone's numbers are different. So statistical methods of dosing insulin are effectively useless. Now this is a problem because insulin can act in the human body for hours after administration. If you put too much insulin in the body, you can force blood sugar too low, a hypo, hypoglycemia, which can induce a coma. However, if you put too little insulin in the body, the blood glucose levels remain too high, hyper events, in which case you cause chronic damage in the organs, causing kidney failure, blindness, need for amputations, and shortened lifespan. So you need to get it right. Uh, what do we have to work with? Well, this chap is kindly modeling for us. Um, there is an insulin pump, which is that big thing with an infusion line, uh, putting insulin into the body. Uh, the other thing on his, on his stomach is called a continuous glucose monitor or CGM that monitors glucose levels, not in blood, but in interstitial fluid beneath the skin. He also will prick his finger, a painful process uh, up to you know, six times, eight times a day. Um, now, the errors associated with these all are significant. So blood finger prick measurements plus or minus 10 percent CGM. Um, you have uh, various offsets. The main problems with CGM, one is that it's a compartment away from blood, so you've got to factor in the dynamics of blood glucose interacting with interstitial fluid to produce the interstitial fluid levels. And the other problem is that on average, it's giving you numbers that are 12 and a half minutes late, which may not sound a lot until you remember that's the length of time it takes to beam a message to the Mars rover on Mars. So we have to do something a bit different. Whoops, we have to do something a bit different because uh, what we want is an AI that can synthesize all the data from the past the medical history of someone with uh, type one to advise on insulin dosage. And it's not just anyone with type one, we're going for the most unstable part of the spectrum. 
You see, uh, endocrinologists talk of uh, glycemic variability. What they're describing is what mathematicians call a stability spectrum. And the interesting thing is that lots of other people are building artificial pancreas candidates, all of which will work for low to moderate glycemic variability, but all of the alternative solutions fail at high glycemic variability, particularly the so-called brittle type one. Um, so 56% of the spectrum are not well handled by existing technologies and 30% forget about it. They're not handled at all. And the irony there is that that 30% is the cohort most desperately in need of an artificial pancreas. Why do competitors not work? Well, essentially uh, existing forms of machine learning and related techniques like fuzzy logic rely on good data to learn from, good training data. For brittle type one or just merely unstable type one, there is no good training data. Their medical histories are a history of therapeutic failure. Um, it's, similarly, the instability means that other techniques also fail. Um, and uh, beta bionics, for example, or a simple biohormonal approach doesn't work uh, because you're using another hormone called uh, glucagon to counter-regulate against insulin. So one lot of mistakes are replaced by another lot of mistakes. And the problem is that the underlying sugar that glucagon uses, a thing called glycogen, um, yeah, stops being available with highly unstable type one. It's, it, it's easy to use up, it's slow to replenish. And you look at the medical histories and it's quite terrifying watching how the glycogen availability is dropping over, over a week, for example. So this is a difficult environment. Um, our results show, well, I'm, I'm showing a user interface there with a tragically out of date uh, iPhone, but forgive me. Um, we took um, data from individuals at Westmead Hospital with very high glycemic variability. And this is one. CGM data on the top every five minutes, the blood glucose at the bottom. Uh, they look almost nothing alike. There, there, there is a sort of a rough relationship, but it's very hard to, to make a sensible relationship out of that. Fortunately, the AI could see patterns that we couldn't. Uh, interesting things included it saying, look, uh, we, I was warned by endocrinologists that they had a hunch that in fact blood glucose peaks much higher than CGM data shows, and turns out that they were right, according to the AI. The AI also put in some paranoid spikes that you can, you can reject if you want to, uh, if you're the clinician, but uh, it erred on the side of caution. Uh, so basically we've achieved a unified mathematical model for this individual. So we can then design insulin for him for the first time in his life. Now we can do better than that because there's a lot of ambiguity in these models. So we get all the data from the models encoded as chromosomes that I showed before, and you pile up all the chromosomes together and the machine can build histograms of different parameters in the human body. And it can say, I'm certain that I'm certain that that histogram value, that parameter value is right. Or it can say, there is ambiguity, but I know what it is, so I can work my way around that. Or it can say, and this is still a useful result, in fact, a very useful result, I have no idea. So the AI can say to the clinician, look, there are some parameters where it is impossible to know, but we, we can work with that. How do we work with that? We have an adversarial process whereby we have two AIs running, and we can run this on a laptop, isolated. We demonstrated this in 2019, um, whereby you have one AI trying to design insulin strategies based on candidate values and histograms, and the adversary then tries to ruin those strategies. So, and this works in real time, unlike generative adversarial networks. So we could demonstrate a um, generation of 30 hours of insulin strategy within 20 minutes. Uh, and so what does that look like very quickly? Uh, well, there's WM2's actual medical history with the reconstructed models. Uh, step one, uh, and the green is where you want the, the trajectories to go. The crosshatch is very bad places where you don't want the trajectories to go. As you can see from his actual medical history on the left, the poor man spends a lot of his time in bad places where he doesn't want to be. Uh, step one, we said to the AI, do something that looks like a basal and a bolus, like conventional insulin dosage. 
And it said, yeah, we can do that. It's a lot better than status quo. It's not perfect because this is the first iteration, but it's a lot better. And then we did something really interesting and we said, okay, ignore the whole basal bolus dichotomy. You just using adversarial processes, generate a, your best strategy. Can you generate an insulin strategy? And this is new strategy. This is outside the training data um, that will actually control this man's blood glucose. Yes, we can. So the adversarial process has generated novel information that's fully explainable so the clinician can interrogate what it all means and be told what it means and interact with, with the AI to design um, a, a good insulin strategy that for the first time, in this man's case, will regulate blood glucose appropriately. And we're actually going to start the proper clinical study in a couple of months' time at Westmead Hospital. So that's the last piece of the puzzle and the demonstration that it works. So the final point is um, the international literature thinks that uh, individualized control for type 1 diabetes is currently an open research topic, and we've demonstrated that they're wrong. It's case closed. We've solved the problem. Well, good. Fantastic. That was a very impressive talk. Um, so thanks a lot, Nigel. Um, now we probably have time for one question. Uh, hopefully Nigel will be hanging around after. So if you don't get your question answered, you can ask him personally after. So does anyone have any burning questions they'd like to ask? Yep. I'll just come up to you with the mic. Thank you. Uh, I've got one, one coming, Robin. Hopefully you too. Thank you. Thanks. Very nice um, presentation. I was on the previous uh, slide. You had kind of how you could bring this even more under control. Yes. I was wondering about the number of interventions, so insulin injections as well as insulin tests. That, that, that did they decrease, increase? Right. Is, was there what was the pattern? It's session? infusions rather than injections. Uh, okay. that, yeah. Um, and so you can do much finer granularity of pulses. They're micro pulses. Yeah. And it's interesting because it looks completely different from the medical history, which from an AI viewpoint is really interesting because it means it's generating completely novel strategies outside training data. But yeah, it's micro pulses. And okay. it, it exploits the um, insulin sensitivity because one point of uh, being able to evolve structure from the medical history is we can also reconstruct the variability across the circadian rhythm of insulin sensitivity. And so the AI did something that we didn't expect, but in hindsight made perfectly good sense, which it packed in the, the insulin over the night when you've got low sensitivity. And then when the sensitivity improves across the day, the insulin's already in place. And so then you can modulate with much finer control across the day. And then of course, as they have meals, you, you, you know, you, you increase more pulse yeah. in there. Cool. Uh, following up on that, did you look at the long term? Was there change in this insulin uh, sensitivity over time, over months or so? Uh, no, we, what we want to do, and the only real way to do this is with a clinical study, um, is uh, monitor HbA1c. And we'll do a four month study that actually has a look at how we affect HbA1c. And that, that should be pretty exciting. Actually. I think Robin had a question if it's time. Is, is it time step? But I'm available afterwards if you want to chat. Yeah. I was just wondering, Nigel, if you can comment, obviously, in some of the work you've done, if you looked at the long-term impact on morbidity and therefore, indeed, the health economic outcomes, and I think people might be interested in some of those projections for what this could actually achieve. Yeah, uh, that's a good point, actually. Um, yeah, the US CDC has said that for every 1%, you reduce the HbA1c, you reduce the risk of chronic comorbidities, which are blindness, kidney failure, need for amputations, shortened lifespan by an average 15 years. Uh, you reduce these risks by 40%. So, uh, and in particular, we think based on that stimulation um, that we can reduce at least 1% and we're, we're hoping that we can push it to 2%. And so uh, we expect to have a significant impact and also reduction in incidence and severity of day-to-day -day adverse events, so quality of life 
is also a huge issue here. Excellent, very worthy cause. So just um, give Nigel another round of applause and thank him. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Tony Keating from ResApp. Um, so Tony has over 10 years of experience in commercializing technology. Tony created the initial business strategy for ResApp and has led the commercialization of ResApp's technology to date. Previously, Tony was director commercial engagement at the, universe, at the UniQuest, um, one of the global leaders in commercialization of University of Technology. Um, while at UniQuest, Tony held roles as interim chief executive officer and non-executive director for a number of privately held venture capital fund funded startup companies. Prior to joining UniQuest, Tony held business development and engineering management roles at Exa Corporation, a US-based software company that was listed on the NASDAQ and later acquired by Dassault Systems. Tony holds a Bachelor of Engineering and Master of Engineering Science and a Doctor of Philosophy in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Queensland. Tony also has an Executive Certificate of Management Leadership from the MIT Sloan School of Management. So Tony's gonna to talk to us about ResApp today. Welcome, Tony. Great, well, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present to this audience and I will thank the Queensland AI Hub for the opportunity to present uh, here in our home state. I find myself presenting more in southern states or out west. Um, as a publicly listed company, we tend to get around and do a lot of these presentations. Uh, so this is a really nice opportunity to present ResApp Health um, to I think a, a group of peers um, more than shareholders and investors. Uh, so I've hopefully expanded on a few things in this presentation that gets you a little bit more interested in some of the technology that we use in ResApp. Uh, so at ResApp, our, I guess our focus uh, as a company is we build digital health solutions for respiratory disease. Uh, and we build those using machine learning algorithms based on audio from patients, whether they're cough sounds, in the case of diagnosing diseases like pneumonia or croup, uh, to snoring or breathing sounds when we're diagnosing uh, conditions like sleep apnea. Uh, and so our, our sort of core DNA is analyzing sound using machine learning uh, to develop health, outcome, health outcomes in the end. So just to set the stage and to set the, the problem definition here that we have, that we set out to solve, uh, respiratory disease is probably not as sexy as curing cancer, um, but you know most of us in this room will have gone to the doctor at least once, if not twice, every year with a cough or a fever or a runny nose. Uh, those are all the symptoms of respiratory disease. And when we look at it from a global perspective, you know, we're estimating that over 700 million doctor visits occur every year with someone just turning up with a, with a common cold or not a common cold, a, a common symptom. It can, can get quite serious. So if you look at diseases such as bronchiolitis or asthma exacerbations or COPD exacerbations or pneumonia, these are really common reasons for someone being admitted to the hospital. So while you may turn up to your GP, you may end up all the way through the emergency department into a ward sitting on a ventilator potentially, as we've all seen with, with COVID. The other interesting factor is that with smoking history, with poor air quality, um, and I guess with a developing healthcare system, we also see a huge prevalence of these respiratory conditions throughout Asia. Um, and you know, the, the start of COVID pandemic, you know, starting in Asia is, is probably no coincidence there either. Uh, going into the clinical aspects of respiratory disease, respiratory disease can be broken down effectively into two different opportunity or two different areas. First of all, you have your upper respiratory tract, so above your trachea. Um, these are tend to be milder, more self-limiting diseases, you know, such as just you know, your basic sore throat, your common cold. Um, but where the real clinical challenge comes in is when that disease has come into the, your lungs. So what we call a lower respiratory tract disease. And that's where you get the more serious conditions like a pneumonia, like an asthma exacerbation or a COPD exacerbation. You can get bronchiolitis in small children. Uh, and these diseases need to be cared for. These are not self-limiting. These are diseases which may require antibiotics, may require steroids. Today, as you have all experienced, I'm sure, you walk into a GP's office with a cough. Um, the first thing he or she does is put a stethoscope on your chest and your back to listen to you breathing. Um, so that's the, the, the tool of choice, I guess, for diagnosing these diseases. If something's found to be of interest there, that might send you off for a chest X-ray or a CT scan for further investigations. 
I guess what I'm getting at here is it's actually quite a complex process. There's no one blood test that tells you, yes, you've got pneumonia or yes, you've got COPD. Uh, it's a very complex, time-consuming, very subjective process based on the skill of the clinician, the tools that they have available to them, and in some situations, how much money that you have. So, you know, in the US, for example, you're talking about three to $400 for a chest X-ray. So quite an expensive um, set of tests to be able to get a confirmatory diagnosis. The other thing is that it's actually quite inaccurate. Uh, we've done studies, large studies of over a thousand patients in the US where we have two clinicians look at every patient and those clinicians disagree in about 30% of the time. So there's a huge discrepancy and, and I guess variability between what's called interrater agreement or you know, one doctor disagreeing with the other doctor. So we started to look at this challenge based on some work by Dr. Rodantha Aberatney at the University of Queensland a number of years ago. He was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to look at diagnosing pneumonia in the developing world. And what he came up with was this idea of using cough sounds as a way to look inside the lungs. So what he found was that there were certain signatures inside cough sounds that could tell us what's going on inside the lungs, whether there's fluid buildup from something like pneumonia, where, where the airways are constricting due to asthma. And so what we do basically, and then you know, we, we are not fancy machine learning. Um, you know, the previous speaker did a great job of showing you know, the, the next generation of machine learning. We're very basic machine learning, supervised machine learning. We take cough sounds, we take a large data set of cough sounds versus clinical diagnosis, we put those together and we come up with algorithms to diagnose disease. Just to give you a bit of a flavor for, for what these sounds look like, these are four different cough sounds from pneumonia all related through to bronchiolitis. You can sort of see the differences here. Obviously machine learning just really amplifies those differences and really finds out exactly what is different. So our technology that we've built from this machine learning, um, I guess, history is ResApp DX. So ResApp DX, ResApp Diagnostic, is a smartphone app that listens to cough signatures and is able to differentially diagnose these common diseases. We use audio feature extraction, so we extract certain features from the audio. We then put them through artificial neural networks or even basic logistic regression um, classifiers because they work. Uh, and then we effectively do this all on device. So that's a really important factor here is we don't have to send anything up to the cloud. We don't have any massive processing anywhere. It's all done on an Apple iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy phone. We use the built-in microphone of the phone. So it's, there's no hardware to attach to the phone. So we've been able to uh, effectively get the high performance out of that microphone. Finally, we're CE marked approved. So approved as a true medical device in Europe and here in Australia as a class 2A medical device. Really straightforward to use. And we've been really consciously building up through usability studies how to make this really easy to use. Effectively hold the phone an arm's length away from the patient or yourself, cough five times, enter a few details about yourself, enter a few symptom details, whether you've had a runny nose, whether you've had a fever, and then bang, straight there and then instantaneously provided a diagnosis for the doctor to then act upon. So here, this patient has a lower respiratory tract disease, i.e. in the lungs, and it's most likely pneumonia. So as we're a medical device, we needed to be clinically validated. We've now run uh, three large clinical studies in both children and adults, both here in Australia and in the US, uh, with over a thousand patients in each of those clinical studies. This is not our training data. This is our prospective double-blind clinical study results. And as you can see, we've gotten great results just remember that number that I said before, earlier, the 30% of doctors disagree with each other when they're diagnosing these diseases. We're, we're looking at accuracy rates of in the high 80s, if not in the 90s. Uh, we also publish and present this work in, you know, regularly at clinical conferences and in medical journals. So the next question in all of these sort of technologies is how do you get this to market? Uh, and what we've seen recently, especially even more recently, and I'll come to that soon, is really the growth in digital health, uh, and in particular, telehealth. So telehealth, if you haven't seen it, you know, it's basically talking to your doctor over a Skype link, over a video link. Uh, there's a number of limitations with that. Obviously, they don't have the ability to use a stethoscope. They don't have the ability to touch and feel you. Um, but you know, they are today performing a huge number of telehealth consultations with patients, uh, both here in Australia, but also in the US and in China, uh, in the UK and in Europe. 
what we've seen here is really four factors driving this. Uh, so the first factor is that it's a large market. You know, there is estimates that a large proportion of those GP visits that we do can be replaced by these virtual visits. Uh, we've seen consumers being really demanding about seeing healthcare. You know, you no longer want to have to wait a day or two to see your GP. You want to order your doctor like you order an Uber and just be able to have them straight there and then. The cost of care, and this is the payer side of things, is significantly reduced with telehealth. You can imagine going to a doc, uh, to an ED at midnight is going to cost the, your payer, your insurer, a thousand plus dollars, if not you know, thousands of dollars. A telehealth consultation is $30, $40. So significant cost savings. And then finally, we've now started to see people like the NHS start to reimburse for telehealth. You know, Medicare here with the COVID um, crisis started to reimburse for telehealth as well. And as, as, I, as I said, COVID has accelerated this. In the US, they're looking at a billion telehealth visits this year. In China, in just a month, they had over a billion telehealth visits. Here in Australia, now that we've um, got reimbursement through Medicare, we're seeing a good proportion, so 30% plus of GP visits are now done virtually. But obviously, here's the problem. Half of those telehealth visits are respiratory related. And as I said earlier, when you're talking to your doctor over a video consultation, they don't have a stethoscope to stick on your chest. They can't tell if that cough is due to an upper respiratory tract infection, a common cold, and you can be sent home to sit in bed and wait, or whether it's gotten into the lungs and whether you should go to the emergency department or you should be prescribed antibiotics or you should be prescribed steroids in the case of asthma. And so that's what we provide. We provide that option. So because we were able to use the patient's phone, record the coughs at the patient end, and then send the diagnosis to the doctor at the other end, the doctor then has uh, an effective way to manage those patients who present with respiratory symptoms. Rather than just saying, I'm not sure, I think you need to go into the office for me to listen to you with a stethoscope, or actually more likely is what's happening is send them straight to an X-ray or a CT. So we've integrated this technology now with telehealth partners, Covio and Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix is a, a Brisbane company. Covio also has uh, significant development uh, work done here in Brisbane. So we're really excited about those. WMA is another Brisbane company. Um, so it's great to be working locally. Uh, but we're really excited about Medgate. Medgate are a Swiss company. Uh, they are probably the oldest telehealth provider in the world. Um, they provide the majority of telehealth throughout Switzerland. Uh, and in fact, if you go to the doctor in Switzerland under some insurance schemes without talking to Medgate first, the insurance scheme does not pay for your doctor visit. So there's a, a huge incentive to use Medgate before you go to the doctor. Lauren feels like she's been hit by a truck. We all know that feeling. It starts off subtle. We wish it would go away, but then it just gets worse. Lauren has three options. One, call to try and make an appointment to see your doctor today, take the day off work, drive to the doctor's office, and then wait in the waiting room. <laughs> Two, go to an urgent care facility or emergency room and wait. Or three, if she's one of the tens of millions of Americans who have access to telehealth, she can make a quick booking through her telehealth app and be talking to her doctor via a video link from the comfort of her own home within minutes. Telehealth is the fast, easy, and convenient way to seek medical advice. And it's not just convenient for Lauren. Telehealth saves her employer or health insurance company hundreds or even thousands of dollars per visit. Lauren simply fills out an appointment form, which is then sent directly to the doctor for review. The doctor reviews her information and contacts her via a video call within minutes. But it's not perfect. With some difficulty, the doctor diagnoses Lauren with a potential respiratory disease. But because he can't accurately diagnose her over the video link, he directs her to an in-person visit to the doctor's office for further testing. Ugh, this is the last thing that Lauren wants to do. This is why Rest App Health is so amazing and keeps the telehealth model effective. We're developing the world's first clinically accurate diagnostic test for respiratory disease that uses only a smartphone. Using Rest App, all Lauren has to do is cough into her smartphone for her doctor to receive an accurate respiratory disease diagnosis. Now when she connects to her doctor, he or she has all the information, including Rest App's diagnosis. No hardware other than her smartphone is required, and she's happy because she doesn't need a visit to the doctor's office for further tests. Lauren's provided with treatment options and immediately begins her road to recovery. 
Life just got better with telehealth and rest app. So we actually created that video a couple of years ago. I'm hoping maybe next year I can cut the whole first part out that we're all knowing what's going on with telehealth. Um, you know, five years ago, nobody in Australia anyway knew much about telehealth. So just to summarize, I, I think we're solving a really important problem as we start to virtual turn to a virtual care model for healthcare, uh, which is happening globally. COVID's accelerated it. We're not going backwards. Um, we have this problem that up to 50% of those visits are respiratory related. You know, we're going to have a similar problem in cardiology. We're going to have a similar problem in other areas where we need these remote, these ability to remotely assess patients. Um, you can't just do it with just video. There are other tools that are required. Um, we've conclusively demonstrated now using a number of clinical studies that cough sound analysis does give us a very accurate picture of what's going on inside your lungs. Uh, and so, you know, we've taken this now through to approvals. We've gone through the CE marking process through the TGA approvals here in Australia. Um, and it's now available. We've now partnered with telehealth providers to get this into the market. And we're really at, at an exciting stage for the company now that we have the product uh, and we're out there effectively selling it um, and, you know, seeing it being used by patients and clinicians. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Another awesome speech and, and some really interesting technology there. So thank you. That was great. Um, any questions from the audience? There we go. Patient and very good product. Is this all exactly available for all a smartphone or only for iPhone? Last time I heard it was only iPhone. And if that, when is Android coming to the lock? Yep. Uh, so it's now available on Android, um, on select Android phones. Um, um, I think it's nine and Android nine and above, uh, but it's it's primarily on Samsung devices. Um, so just as a bit of a background as well, because I think this audience may be interested for the machine learning side of things. You know, what we do here is we record sound um, and we need to be very careful that we're recording the same sound with an iPhone versus a Samsung phone versus a LG phone versus a Huawei phone. So we've had to actually go and develop some really robust validation procedures that can take different types of phones, put the audio through those phones and ensure that we still get the clinical results that we give. It's really important. Um, so we've spent a long time now developing those processes. Um, how have you found the variability in results from when it's the, the mother holding it in front of her child versus when it's being clinically used by a doctor who has repetitive usage of it and kind of knows how to position it and you're also having to consider the various different environments of and I imagine the sound that it captures in a home with maybe crying ch children in the background. Yeah yeah so we've had to do it so there's a couple of couple of points there so the one is the usability to holding it in the right right place. Um, we've done large usability studies here in Australia and in the US as part of our regulatory pathways um, where we stick people in a room and get them to use it and, and make sure that works so we're very comfortable that that patients or just general people will use it correctly. Um, the background noise was an issue. So a few years ago, we ran a study in the US um, where we didn't control that background noise very well. Uh, and that study was not a great success. Um, so we learned a lot from the algorithm perspective to improve the algorithms to be able to deal with that background noise, uh, but also added a, a neat user feature, which you didn't see in the, in the demo there, where we actually have a really basic feature of a background noise meter um, that basically measures the background noise. And if it's too loud, we don't let someone to con continue. We say, go to a quiet place uh, to do it. I was a little worried about that, that no one would ever find a quiet enough place because a lot of our early work was done in clinics. Um, but those clinics are actually quite noisy. You know, we did the studies in emergency departments and they're, they're quite noisy environments. So we're, we're pretty comfortable that, you know, it's not gonna be a, an issue or it's not an issue. You. So I'm thinking in a situation where the patient has used it, they've coughed into the phone, the doctor is remote. Yep. How do you share the result with a doctor? Uh, so, so we utilize the telehealth platforms to do that. So uh, as an example, we are integrated within, so our algorithms effectively are integrated within the Medgate app, as an example, or the CoView app or the Phoenix Health app. So the patient sees our effectively user interface saying cough five times and then we use the CoView's back end or Medgate's back end to send the PDF 
to the doctor at the other end. So it's, it's integrated into that telehealth platform and it's integrated into the workflow of the clinician, uh, which is really important as well. Oh, look, I think that this is a tool that can be used. It's not a replacement for a stethoscope. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the thing that we see on, on a commercial level here is that you don't have that stethoscope in that telehealth consultation. So, you know, we're not trying to go into a GP's office and say, pull a stethoscope off the doctor and say, he use this instead. In, in a triage situation, um, you know, we've, we're working with some hospitals where you use it in the waiting room, for example, where a nurse could use it who may not be as good as a, a clinician, although that, that's arguable as well. Um, but, you know, the, to be able to, to remove some of that subjectivity, um, yeah, I don't, we're not going to replace the stethoscope. I think that's the, the example. It's an additional tool for the doctor to use. Look, I think a number of companies have tried to commercialize that, a Bluetooth stethoscope. Um, they've struggled big time to get it into people's homes. I mean, it's like the, the lab test that we all want in our bathroom that's been coming in the next five years for the last 20 years. Uh, I think the problem can be solved in a chronic setting where someone's got a chronic disease like a COPD or an asthma where they may buy something to use on and on and on. But it's very rare for someone to go and buy something that you know, their kid might have a cough in six months time. It's just not going to happen. Okay, so we are out of time for questions, but um, hopefully Tony will be around after so you can ask him in person later on. Um, so yeah, another great uh, talk. Thanks a lot, Tony. Um, we'll now welcome our next speaker. So we have Marie Bear from Wanji, um, who will be speaking to us today. Um, let me just get my papers aligned. So Marie Bear is the CEO and founder of Wanji, uh, which is a health management platform for people to track and communicate their health compressing time to diagnosis. The platform is scaling to manage patient health history, adverse event management, real world evidence and remote monitoring, providing concise efficiencies for fast track clinical trials. Her work with Wanji has been recognized by Forbes in the top 50 women led startups disrupting health tech and CNET showing the Australian company has become a growing influence in the digital health sector. So welcome, Marie. It's now more important than ever to look after yourself. Keep track of your immunizations. Monitor your symptoms and record any illnesses. Upload and store all your medical reports and test results. Remember to take all your medication. Discuss each and every little detail with your doctor just to be safe. With the YG Health Management app, you can do just that. Wanji is your personal health assistant that records everything you and your doctor need to know. Symptoms, medication, test results, scans, pathology and vaccinations, giving you the peace of mind you need. Download Wanji today. I'm Marie Bear, and I'm founder and CEO of Wanji. And as you can see, the Wanji health management platform is available now and helping people to manage their health. But today, I'm here to talk to you about a new innovation where consumer health meets clinical trials. So our company, company is improving life by revolutionising the clinical trial process worldwide. Ooh, yeah. 
We're creating simple innovation that gets results. And along the way, we're looking to solve some of the problems that are inherent in our health system now. And this one here is where over 60% of people don't have access to their health information and it impacts their, the cost of their health care and the ability for them to be diagnosed. And now with COVID, we have telehealth, the impact of telehealth and people communicating and, and seeing their doctors via telehealth is excellent. But if you have a chronic illness with many years of chronic illness history and multimorbidity, it's very, very difficult for you to communicate your health during a telehealth appointment without having access to a personal digital health record like Wanji. So this problem of access of health history is also a problem with clinical trials. So clinical trials have difficulty accessing patient information, evidence of any adverse events, and ongoing remote monitoring. And this is particularly a problem if we're looking to fast track trials, knowing what's happening within them and providing real world evidence. So the impacts are obviously following protocols, the cost of those trials and the pre-screening and monitoring potential inaccuracies and errors. So I saw this recently and you may have also um, this happened to you as well, but my husband went along and participated in a clinical trial and he had to, to physically go into the consulting room and fill out his history on a piece of paper. And then every day during the trial, complete a piece of paper with what medication he'd taken and any adverse events. So there's serious innovation required to be able to improve um, the, the efficiencies in these trials. And also potential collaboration for telehealth during these trials. Imagine if you could do this pre-screening and the monitoring using the telehealth solutions, and we're looking to do that. So the market for clinical trials is, is massive. Um, by the end of the, this year, it's expected there's going to be 47 billion spent on global clin clinical trials, and that um, compounding each year by 8%. And what we've seen is obviously during COVID, uh, an increase in trials around COVID and the conditions associated with COVID, and a decrease in therapeutic clinical trials. And we would like to be part of that. So how can we help? So with our platform, we'll provide patient health history, management of adverse events, ongoing remote monitoring, and real world data that can be used in these fast track clinical trials. How will it work? Patients will help provide their health history and day-to-day -day information about their health, whether it's sickness or wellness and any symptoms that might arise as a result of the trial or anything random for that matter. And provide that monitoring to the clinical trial company with consent. So the platform is all about collecting and informing on health information around the patient for the trial. Providing efficiencies on the processes, such as pre-screening, monitoring, adverse events, remote monitoring and tracking symptoms.
So our, our company is around designing simple innovation that works and about sharing that health information securely and using technologies that do that, such as fire. So if you'd like to know more about our solution and um, be part of the scaling of our company, please contact me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for telling us about that, um, Marie. Anyone have any questions? Yep. Thank you for that presentation, Marie. Just a couple of quick questions. How does your app interact with my health records, which people have not taken up as much as they would want to, to make data available universally? And also, uh, if you have, how does Wangi compare to Health Match, which is the Sydney-based, again, startup, which has raised capital, again, trying to do where does this fit in between those two? They are two very, very good questions. Well, firstly, we are a global solution and we are about, uh, we're about a private health record that people can input their own information to. That's not something that the My Health Record provides. And My Health Record is only available in Australia. It's a government um, product. And the sex, second question is around Health Match. Fantastic solution. And, and what Health Match does is actually solves another problem in the sector, which is around finding candidates for clinical trial. So, health match, tag, Wanji. Any other questions? Another one? Yeah, no worries. <laughs> oh, another one down here. Uh, with, the, with the data and privacy and things, where, if it's a global solution, where is this data being held like in each country with its own respective service or centrally? Because everywhere they've got different laws. Yes, we'll, we'll uh, yeah, it's available centrally, uh, centrally at the moment, but, but on AWS servers, so we can accommodate that. Thank you. Any questions? Excellent, thank you for that question, great question. Um, so when you have a chronic illness, time is your enemy. And the more information that you can provide to a clinician around your symptoms and about your health history, you're more likely to be diagnosed sooner. So our solution provides you a place to track those symptoms over time. Not to be learned about medical records, and but at the same time be careful about duplication of documentation, and because it creates another extra layer of complexity for everyday GPs. So that's probably we already got uh, different uh, companies uh, owning medical records in different ways, manners. The public system is the same: the Queensland government versus the Medicare. So it's really hard to handle all this multiplicity of records. Um, I'm not sure what the question is, but yes, um, I guess we're not, we're not aiming to provide uh, another job for a clinician to do. Um, what, what we're enabling is people uh, to have their own information so they can communicate more effectively. And once again, time is their enemy when they have a you know, health condition. So it's really providing them a tool. So we, we're having two products. So we have Wanji, which is our consumer product, and we're now launching our clinical trials platform. 
right, for them to uh, be able to um, manage the efficiencies of the trials around consumer information. So we actually are, are moving into a different space, but also using our first tool. So we come with it from a consumer lens, but we're about providing those efficiencies uh, in short track clinical trials. Beautiful, thank you. Give a round of applause. Thank you for Marie. Okay, so tonight we have our final speaker. Um, we have Dr. Haman Gamagami. Um, Dr. Haman is the head of artificial intelligence at Medicine. Haman has over 14 years experience in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And at Medicine, he's leading the research and development of cardiac and respiratory machine learning algorithms. Um, and artificially intelligent AI systems for the next generation of IoT enabled healthcare devices. He holds a PhD in signal processing and machine learning for intelligent systems. His research interests and work include speech activity detection, speech coding, speech recognition, speaker diarization and attribution, speaker recognition, machine learning for odor discrimination, as well as automatic respiratory and cardiac disease detection and analysis using biomedical signals. So lots of interest there. Um, he has over 30 peer reviewed publications and four international patents. So welcome. Hi everyone. Um, apologies for being late. I had to get my son from daycare and then get his mom to take him. So sorry to the other speakers. I, mi I missed your presentation. Um, I work for Medicine. I'm the head of artificial intelligence at Medicine. And Medicine's basically designed an electronic stethoscope, which works with an app on your phone that is also a patient management system. So you can enroll a patient, record heart sounds, record lung sounds, and keep track of that information. Um, but what we've done from the artificial intelligence side is sort of look at what we can do to get further benefits from this. But on its own, obviously, a uh, digital stethoscope that you can use remotely from any location is itself um, quite a useful tool. So I'll just talk about sort of machine learning artificial intelligence in, in the sort of context that fits into my presentation. Then I'll talk about how we use that for remote health and telemedicine and what exactly we've done. So the product is actually called Stethi, the digital stethoscope. So I'll go into that and sort of explain what we've done, what algorithms we're using. So generally with machine learning, artificial intelligence, you're trying to use some sort of modeling technique, mathematical modeling technique to try to achieve some sort of discrimination, prediction, classification. So in this example, I'm showing a speech signal uh, and it's a system to discriminate between speech and non-speech. So you can have a simple modeling technique, extract certain features that you can use support vector machines or other techniques to then discriminate and perform a classification where you have a system which automatically identifies speech in a recording. So there are a variety of modeling techniques and they all, yeah, sure. There are a variety of modeling techniques and they all depend on what you're trying to achieve. Essentially, if you can get away with a less complicated model, that's the way to go if you can get the results that you want. But you can also apply deep learning. You can have engineered features that you extract from your data and then try to perform some sort of modeling and discrimination prediction classification. Or you can use raw information, use deep learning that essentially will learn those features for you or even a better version of those features. There are a lot of uses for machine learning, artificial intelligence, it all started with speech and image processing, really. That was the sort of beginning of signal processing, machine learning. And then now it's applied to many fields because of data. It's a data-driven field, so the more data you have, the more you can do with it. And essentially, the, you know, if you, if you have certain data that a human can use to perform a task, you can essentially achieve it. So that's the key in trying to find applications. If you see someone looking at various data and can perform a task that's not instruction-based, then you can use machine learning to do it. But essentially, it all just boils down to 
some technique that can learn the fundamental features that represent the space you're looking at. So here I've got an example of a face recognition deep, deep neural network. And they've looked at various um, layers of this deep neural network to see what it's looking at. And when you go down to the fundamental bottom layer, it's really just edges. So if you learn the building blocks of the space that you're working with, with a combination of those building blocks, you can essentially build anything. So I don't know how familiar everyone is with say GANs, generative adversarial networks that can do, create new uh, things. Uh, essentially intelligence is creativity. Repetition is, is useless. If you can do something new in that space, it means you've learned the building blocks of that space. So you can do that with various techniques. So deep learning is one. Um, in terms of remote health and telemedicine, you know, I'm sure everyone's familiar with lots of image recognition work that's been done on, you know, MRI data, image data for medical use. Um, but essentially collecting this data is a big problem, which the previous speaker was also pointing out, um, especially in the medical field. So that's, that's one of the main issues that sort of can hinder um, the progress. But there are significant advantages. It means you can democratize healthcare. Essentially, everyone can have access to the best doctors, diagnosis, or screening tools. So STETHI is the stethoscope that medicine has made. ADA is what we call the artificial intelligence framework that sort of runs behind STETHI and is the brains behind STETHI, essentially. But what you have to realize is STETHI, as a stethoscope, it can capture heart sounds, it can capture lung sounds, and you can also capture speech if you have it in the room. So you can do a lot with this information. But on top of that, we have geolocation information, weather. So there's all this information to work with. With um, ADA, it's essentially a collection of machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms. I can basically break it down into a group of algorithms for segmentation, where we segment heart sounds and lung sounds to get some information. And there's also classification algorithms that essentially use that information for diagnoses. So in terms of heart sounds, obviously everyone's aware that you have your S1 and S2 heart sounds, your first sound and your second sound, which are the sounds of your valves closing, but they're related to the contraction of the heart and the relaxation of the heart. So we essentially started with segmentation of heart sounds into an algorithm that can automatically detect the start time and end time of S1 and S2 sounds in a recording. Then from that, you can essentially gain information about the systole and diastole duration. So systole is the duration that the heart is contracting. Diastole is the duration that the heart is relaxing. So there's a lot of information there in that timing. And there's so many studies around ratios of these timings because essentially a heart that's failing is going to contract for longer and relax for less. So as these ratios change, you can really monitor a patient just from that information alone to see if they're going towards heart failure, which happens when systole duration exceeds diastole duration. So there's a lot of information there. There are a lot of diseases that are related to ratios of these two durations. And then there's also information about the energy of these sounds, how loud the S1 and S2 sounds were depending on where the location was. So through relative comparison of these energies, we've actually managed to correlate that information to blood pressure. So both the durations of heart sounds and the loudness can tie back to blood pressure. You can perform a form of non-invasive blood, blood pressure estimation, categorize people based on that. On top of that, we can do arrhythmia detection, so atrial fibrillation, PVCs. That's obviously essentially from those durations as well. Then there's murmur detection. So murmurs are extra additional sounds that occur because of backflow of blood through heart valves not being efficient. So they cause an extra sound in your heart sounds. Doctors can use a stethoscope to hear it, they can't use an ECG to see it. They have to use echo Doppler or some form of ultrasound to essentially confirm it, but it's audible. So that was one thing that we started looking at. And murmurs are quite important. There are a variety of murmurs and they can be attributed to a variety of diseases. But we also look at lung sounds. So just as you have your first and second heart sound and we segment that, you have your inhale and exhale period. So we also segment that. There's a lot of information there, how long you inhaled well compared to your exhale duration and how that relationship changes over time for the same person. We can also do respiratory disease detection. Um, 
and actually, and, uh, so we've actually um, got an FDA clearance for the heart sound segmentation assisted diastole duration. We did a clinical trial. We got our FDA clearance for that. And we've also got our FDA clearance for respiratory rate detection, which makes us the first digital stethoscope in the world that can do respiration, respiratory rate detection from actually listening to your lung sounds and timing that duration. On top of that, we can look at different diseases. We've started partnering up with various partners in Uganda for tuberculosis, India for a variety of respiratory diseases, pneumonia, asthma, bronchitis, upper respiratory infection. So we started collecting all this data and we've just begun to really tie all these together because a lot of respiratory diseases also affect your cardiac performance. You could have murmurs because of tuberculosis. There's various connections here within those segmentation durations and with the classification of diseases that we're just piecing the puzzle together, but we've done a lot already. So, you know, heart sounds, we talked about your heart rate, those durations are the most important thing that you can segment from heart sounds. Previously, there was no tool for doing that. Doing that. You need echo Doppler, you need a technician to sit there with a $40,000 device, get snapshots of your heart and measure those systolic diastole durations. This device does it automatically and it's FDA cleared. We can do murmur detection. We've, there's a database called PhysioNet. Uh, it has a large data set of murmurs. A lot of uh, researchers use it for getting their sort of performance and comparison of performance from murmur detection algorithms. We've read any published result and we've actually just published the journal in that aspect. And we, our best result is so far is 99.9% .9 accuracy in murmur detection. So respiratory rate, inhale, exhale events, and then we're looking at what happens in those durations. Someone might cough during their exhale event from that, we can deduce various conditions. And then in the future, we'll also be looking at speech detection as well. We can do a lot with speech. There's lots of studies around detecting Parkinson's or MS from variations in someone's vocal tract and their speech signal. You can do analysis to see if they're depressed. You can do speech recognition to fill out, say, the prescription for the doctor in a, in a consultation. The doctor could place this between himself and the patient, speak. So there's a lot you can do there. And then once you tie all that together to the geolocation information, weather information about everyone in the world, relationship of how those data that we extract for one person changes over time, we can tie all that together and do a lot more. We can essentially maybe at one stage predict if you're going to go into heart failure way before you go there. So that's pretty much it. So, yep. We're essentially using state-of-the-art techniques. We've got a grant with QUT that we've had for a couple of years. We've got a year more of that, and we've published a lot of journals, and we're sort of on top of that from that aspect. And that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. That was amazing. And I think what stood out to me was the 99.9% .9 accuracy on murmurs. That's incredible. So great technology. Um, open up the floor to questions. I'm sure we have lots. Much for your presentation. Um, being able to differentiate atrial fibrillation from other arrhythmias sounds incredibly useful without an ECG. So can you guys actually do that? And how can you do it without doing the electrical? That reduction? essentially is in uh, variations in the heart sounds. So with ECG, it's obviously way better. And there's, you know, I'm sure you know this study where they looked at like 500,000 ECGs and they uh, came up with some atrial fibrillation diagnosis system. But from the changes in those durations, you, you can detect it. So obviously we're not FDA cleared for that one. We haven't done a trial for that, but you could get that information from variations in someone's heart sound from one, to, one event to the next, but because you're getting those durations. Awesome, thanks. You're welcome. Just interested, uh, depression analysis seemed like, well, to be honest, a big call. <laughs> I was just interested in how that actually works. In well, the there are, there are um, ways of, I think there's one way of when, where they have a certain questionnaire where they get someone to answer or answer back to certain questions and they have a way of evaluating it. So if we can do speech to text from that, we have the same answers to do the same evaluation. 
I just hope they don't get me in the actual experiment <laughs> with my voice. <laughs> well, you don't have to keep any of this information. And so actually I need to note as well that we have a data collection app that anonymizes patients that we use for data collection. So we've streamlined this uh, for this purpose, we've got a, a relationship with Lady Salento now. We're collecting pediatric MoMA data, and um, we have an app that's dedicated to it. You look at four different locations on the heart, multiple locations on the chest, the lung sounds. So um, the app is, was really important because you were mentioning the data collection and clinical trials. I think having that app to anonymize data, so streamline the tagging process has been very helpful for us. With two questions. Uh, one, how much does the device cost? And, and two, the more technical question, what device security do you have um, on Steffi hardware and or software? Yep. So basically about the price because the launch date is probably close. I'm not gonna comment on that because there's lots of discussion around that. So I won't go into that until the launch comes and then you'll know. Um, in terms of, what was your second question, sorry? Around device security. Oh, so they're all HIPAA compliant servers, you know, it's just standard. So we got our FDA clearance for the app, we got all of that, it's all sorted. Uh, this is very simple question. Do you have any target price for this one? Um, that's, again, that's not my sort of area to speak about, especially now that the launch is coming up. Oh, right. yeah. Um, is the intention of this product to be, because you mentioned telehealth, is the intention that this product is given to consumers and then connects, you, you know, externally to a healthcare provider, or is the intention for healthcare providers in clinics to be using this in clinic to help to assist them with making determinations? Uh, yeah, both essentially. So they will use it. And then if a patient needs to take it away, they might be given a prescription to get one and take it away and then they can use it if someone needs to be monitored consistently. But then, it, you know, the uses can be for in the field. If you've got healthcare workers that go in the field, uh, all the algorithms are on the phone, so you don't need a network connection to actually get outputs or analytics. And then once you come back, you can upload all information. The follow up from the last question, is there a reimbursement strategy if a patient has to take one of these away? Um, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you about that, but I will, maybe, <laughs> okay. I mean, your health insurance potentially, if you could become something that's necessary. Thank you. I think that's uh, all the time we have for questions, but you know, hopefully you'll be sticking around a little bit after. So if people wanted to ask a, another question, you can ask him afterwards. So thank you very much. Another round of applause. So that was a fantastic um, set of talks and um, thanks all for coming and, and to all of our speakers. Um, we also have our CEO, Sue Kay, here. So thank you for coming along. She's doing a great job of, of running the hub. Um, but uh, most importantly, we wouldn't be able to run this event without the support of our sponsors. And so um, tonight we were sponsored by a local AI company, which is always fantastic for us to support. Um, and they have supported us this evening in running this event. Uh, RSM. So we would love them to just come up and speak a little bit about what RSM does before we close off and um, carry on with our drinking and eating. So I'll just welcome Jacob and Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, I echo the, the thank you and the uh, great presentations today. Uh, and I guess we're living in an exciting time. So I think we mentioned, uh, there was a mention by Tony today about the acceleration of um, telehealth with COVID, but COVID's accelerated everything in this technology space with digital transformation and also uh, the uptake of uh, automation and AI and analytics. So um, as Steph mentioned, uh, I work with RSM. My name is Jacob Elkishin, so I'm a partner with uh, RSM in our risk advisory services. And this is Jeremy, who's gonna talk and introduce himself in a second. So. Um, we, are, we, we do a lot of work in the technology space, but RSM is an audit, tax and consulting firm. So within consulting, we look after um, 
Uh, there's a lot of questions around cyber and security here today, but um, we also uh, look at uh, work a lot in, in the healthcare sector with respect to uh, internal audits um, and uh, also technology consulting. So um, in the technology consulting space, we do work, a lot of work with uh, data analytics, with, um, with automation and artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, RSM has been around for 97 years uh, in, in Australia, and we are the sixth uh, biggest global um, audit tax and consulting firm. Um, and uh, Jeremy uh, works a lot in this uh, technology space and can share a little bit about what we're doing uh, with, with our healthcare clients and, and also, uh, I guess, where, where the future is heading with, uh, with, with a lot of this technology. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, conscious that um, speaking after four amazingly accomplished and fantastic um, presenters, so there's that, and also I'm standing between you and food and drink, so possibly the worst spot for anyone to be talking at at a presentation. Um, as Jacob mentioned, um, RSM, we're all about enabling and assisting um, organisations of all sizes. So for, for those of you that are in the startup phase, um, helping you through every aspect of both your strategic growth and challenges, um, compliance ones down to management of funds, um, and even helping out on the tax side. So we're really there to, to help and support um, the Australian businesses that we get the pleasure of working with and to, to help realise some of the great opportunities and work that's especially coming out of Queensland at the moment um, in the AI space. So technology consulting um, all the way from business advisory to um, tax advice and then for me not being that interested in tax, um, helping out on the strategic side. So getting you comfort over how you can best realize your visions and your dreams and best bring these products um, to the people that, that need them. So we've got some, some brochures which give you a bit of oversight. Jacob and I will be hanging around for a bit to, to talk more about how, if um, there is any ways we can help um, and feel free to come and grab our cards if you need to head off and you can give us a call anytime. So until then, I won't speak anymore. No worries. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, guys. And thanks again for the support. We appreciate it. All righty. So that's the end of the speaking part of the night. Um, as uh, was pointed out, I won't stand between you and food and drinks for too much longer. Um, but just wanted to summarize saying that I think one of the themes I saw come through as we were hearing about all this awesome tech is that, um, you know, this AI technology is enabling um, the access of healthcare to everyone and people who might be limited in their access to healthcare. And I think that's one of the many beautiful things coming out about um, the advancement of this technology for health. So that's something that really excites me. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And also one final thank you to SJ, who's been running around frantically and, and has done a lot of hard work to get this event together. So thank you as well. Yep, big round of applause. <laughs> um, she'll be serving up wine, so you will have another chance to thank her. But yeah, please um, stay and enjoy food and drinks and hopefully get to meet some new people tonight. And, uh, you know, always um, keep a look out on our website for more events like this if you enjoyed tonight. Um, we'd love to put more on for you and also hear your feedback. So enjoy. Thank you.